Welcome to Through Theology in a Year. I'm Michael Patton, and this is session number 10. And we are going to kind of wrap up our section that we've been doing the last few weeks. I mean, it's, it's gone on longer than I expected, but hey, I don't care. What do I care? i got a full year. <laughs> I've got a full two years if I need it to be able to get through theology. But this is Through Theology in a Year, and this is wrapping up our section on the different arenas of theology, the different arenas that we do theology in. I call them arenas, okay? You may have never heard them called that. I've just been doing it for 20 years because it's the best way for me to understand it and for me to teach it. These are the, I, I want you to, guys to be certain type of theologians. And so today's, theolo- today's course is called, So Then How Do We Do Theology? Or How Do We Define Theology? Because this is the defining theology section of, um, of the Through Theology in a Year. So let's go ahead and get started. Last time, if you remember, we finished up on, um, on uh, the folk theology, and hopefully I, was, I got you dislodged, ready to do theology. Really, in, in some ways, I was trying to get you to the point where you, were dis, you, you, were, you, you weren't comfortable, because theology should never be really comfortable. It shouldn't be. All learning shouldn't be comfortable. And so if I made you uncomfortable, then good. I'm sorry. I'm not saying I was right about everything I said last time, but um, if I made you uncomfortable, that's that was my plans. Let's go ahead and see why it's so hard for a folk theologian to learn. I did, I did talk about this last time, but I want to mention this one last time because it's really important. Why is it so hard for a folk theologian to learn? If you're somebody who does theology in the arena of folk, you're, you're, you uh, rely on religious folklore and traditions. Why is it so hard for you to do theology? Because you can't learn. That's what it comes down to. You can't learn. You are not ready to learn. And as I said last time, if you can't get past this, if you can't get past being a folk theologian, you're not going to like this. You're not going to have fun during this course or during this full year. Going through theology with me on this podcast is not going to be an enjoyable time for you. You'll just be throwing things at the at the wherever you listen to this at your your phone or your radio or your wh- wherever the, your TV because you're not going to like it. But if I've gotten you just to a place of discomfort and in some sense enjoying that discomfort because you see the possibilities of what that discomfort can bring about, which is learning and which is openness to God and which is where your heart is open to the Lord and you say, Lord, change whatever needs to be changed because that's how we have to approach it every day. That's what we have to approach our own personal lives with every day. And if we're to love the Lord with all of our minds, how is it that we are going to keep our minds closed but our hearts open to the Lord? That doesn't work. It just won't work. The Lord wants a hundred percent of us. That is why he says, love him with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul. What he's talking about is your entire being, every aspect of who you are. You want to love him with this. And we cannot approach our God with the idea of, look how perfect I already am. You can tweak, you can polish, but you can't change. And we need to be ready to change every time we do theology. Okay, so uh, moving on to, oh, and also, you know, it's, I said this last time, let me say it one more time. It's about how dogmatic you have to be if you are a folk theologian, because you have nothing else to rely on but your dogmatism. And what is the old saying? If you are in the pulpit and people are not believing you, and you don't know what you're talking about, beat the pulpit harder. That's all you got. Speak louder. Yell at people. Beat the pulpit harder if people aren't listening to you. That's all you got. But if it's not all you got, if you if you understand how you believe what you believe, you understand why you believe what you believe, and you understand what you believe, then you can walk people through how you got there. You can walk people through why you think they should be there as well instead of just because it's true, you know. 
And whenever you're a folk theologian, it's true. You know why it's true? Because I know that it's true. Well, you know how that I know that it's true if I'm a folk theologian? Because I just know, deep down inside, I know that what I believe is true. Well, it, you could be right. But at the same time, that does it, that, that is not very confidence building. That's not very persuasive. And it is not very glorifying to the Lord. Because anybody could say that. Anybody in any situation, any religion, any any theological viewpoint, any position that they are in, no matter how dumb it is, you can rely on your feelings. You can say, I just know that I know that I know. It's one of those things. And it won't really work. Okay. So that is the re- that is why it's so hard. Now let's talk about la- let's briefly let's just briefly talk about a couple of more, and then I want to pull them all together because I don't I don't need to spend much time on lay theologian and ministerial theologian and academic theologian because in perspective of what we have talked about the far extreme of being a tabloid theologian or a folk theologian, tabloid theologian person who gets your ta- your theology out of the newspapers daily. It's brand new. The folk theologian, traditions have given them to you. But whenever we're talking about a lay theologian, a lay theologian is, is a person who constructs his or her theology who, unlike the folk and tabloid theologian, is more reflective, and that's a key word, reflective, more reflective upon learned theological concepts. Remember, Remember the the main thing? It's reflection. It's reflection. It's integration. We're going to talk next time about systematic theology and what it means to have a systematic theology. And we're talking about an integration, an integrational approach to theology. Um, Likely to formulate a system of beliefs which distinguishes between essential and non-essential. Why? Why? Why do, you, why do you distinguish whenever you become a lay theologian? Because you have to. You, you have to be, you begin to see different things. Like, like as long as, if you're not relying on, I know that I know, because everything can qualify as I know that I know. You haven't, you, you don't, haven't really thought it through. You just know that you know on everything. So it doesn't matter whether it is the doctrine of the Trinity or my particular interpretation of Matthew chapter 18. I just know that I know. It doesn't matter whether it is any area of theology, no matter how big or how small, if you just know that you know, you can't distinguish between the two. But whenever you study them this way, you begin to say, you know what? This theology, whenever it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, maybe it has more backing, you know, more historical backing, more more um, uh, uh, biblical backing, more rational backing, maybe not quite so much more rational backing, but we'll talk about that later. But all of these things integrate and you say, it, it makes more sense and it must be more important than when you have something much, much smaller, like say you're talking about whether or not Adam and Eve, how long it took them before they sinned in the garden. You know, you don't really know. So you, you can't, it's it's not something you 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 begin to distinguish between those two, and you say one has a lot of backing and a lot of um, a, a lot of reasons to believe. The other one just is a mere opinion. So the mere opinion must be smaller in scale and less essential. Uh, that's not the only way we distinguish between non-essentials and essentials, but we'll talk about that more later. Likely to formulate a system of beliefs which distinguishes between essentials and non-essentials, uh, more reflective upon unfounded traditions. So you're ready now to kick those things that you just realized. You know what? I don't know that I have reasons to believe this, what mom and dad taught me anymore. You know, So I'm holding it a lot more loosely than I used to, those kind of things. And then... You who are more willing to use study tools. You see beforehand, why did you need study tools? <laughs> you already knew it all. Your your heart knew it all. You had a burning in thy bosom that showed you what was true and what was not true. Kind of like the Mormons, you know, whenever they search for truth, although I'm not really saying I, uh, th- that there is a passage, and I have had th- this said to me from Mormons before, that if I just search the truth, and if I find that I have a burning in my bosom, whenever I ask God sincerely, then I'll know it's the truth. I'm not saying that's the only way. I haven't studied Mormonism deeply enough. Uh, I've studied it 
quite a bit, but not deeply enough to say that's the only way they reflect upon their concepts. But it is one which their missionaries certainly do. And they, you wouldn't be willing to use study tools if you already got a burning in your bosom. Why would you need study tools? You see what I'm saying? Okay, um, next we have the ministerial theologian. Now, this is kind of one step up from the lay theologian. And a lay person who constructs his or, uh, ministerial doesn't necessarily have to be somebody in ministry, but you can be in ministry. A lay person who constructs his or her theology who... Unlike the lay theologian is educated, so you, now you have theological methodology. What is theological methodology? What is being educated in theological methodology? Exactly what we're doing right here. So, I mean, you should be graduating during this class sometime, during this whole through theology in a year, to this, this category of a ministerial theologian, which I think is probably the best place to be. Uh, like I said, you don't have to be in ministry. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to have gone to seminary. You just have to have these qualities. Able to use study tools at a more effective level. See, beforehand, you used to be like me, right? Whenever I first started following the Lord and started getting into this and getting excited, and it didn't matter as long as the book had the name Jesus on it, I opened it up and read it because I, I figured it was right. Uh, I didn't know that there were better books and worse books. There were better study tools and worse study tools. There were better publishers and worse publishers. There were more responsible people who did theology this way, and there were less responsible people who really were just relying on, relying on their burning in the bosom. And you do have that across the board, but you got to be able to distinguish between them. Okay, uh, also, you are able to critique personal theolo theology against competing models. Now you're more confident. Now you're ready and you say, you know what? I think I, think I can, uh, uh, you know, study other models of theology. See, beforehand you couldn't. Lay, uh, if, you're, if you're a folk theologian, you do not bother studying other people's views because you got a burning in your bosom that yours is right. So why, why, why do you need to? Why do you need to study and compare yours against theirs and say, maybe I've got mine wrong and maybe theirs is right? But once you begin to graduate to this level, then you begin to say, hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. For the first time, you're saying maybe I'm wrong, which is a very, very good thing to say maybe you're wrong. Okay, next is intent on devoting more time to reflection so that theological integration could take place. Don't need to say anything more on that. Reflection, reflection, reflection. Integration, integration, integration. That's what we're doing. We're using our minds responsibly. We're, 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 we're thinking through more broadly than we have ever thought through before. And then we move on to the next one. What's the next one? Professional theologian. Professional theologian is one who constructs his or her theology and makes a living doing so. Usually they are didactically purposed, which basically means they teach. Uh, uh, didache is the teaching, or didacto, I think, is uh, to teach in the Greek. And so um, they are teaching purposed. And they are teaching purpose towards the lay and pastoral theologians. And they construct, conduct original practical research. They do research on their own. So this is whenever you begin to see their own positions and you're laying out your own kind of firsthand original research in certain areas. And then you critically evaluate common theological trends and folk theology. This is where you write, you're writing books, you're writing articles against these ty types of things we're talking about here today or about these types of things. Uh, critically evaluate common theological trends and folklore. I already said that. Uh, professional theologians are often accused of quenching the spirit. Why do you think they receive this accusation? Well, it should be very evident. People get accused of quenching the spirit anytime by those who don't like you to open their minds up anybody who who already knows what they believe is true they know that they know that they know that what they believe is true then they you know the best thing you, whenever i'm listening to you i feel like 
you know, you're quenching my spirit. Well, yeah, they are quenching your spirit, but it doesn't mean they're quenching the spirit. Uh, that's not what that passage is talking about. People who study deeply and critically, that is not what quenching the spirit is, but that's that, again, that's another folk theology. What does quenching the spirit mean? It means teaching something that makes me feel uncomfortable, right? Okay, then you finally have academic theologian, a professional theologian who constructs his or her theology. Now, here's the key. Here's the key. In an overly speculative manner and with a critical spirit. His dialogue can usually only come with other theologians, and it's often called ivory tower theology. Now, this is where you get to the opposite side. This is where you get to the complete opposite side of folk theology. Now, you're kind of a folk theologian on the other side. You are so hypercritical that your mind isn't open. You can become so hypercritical about everything that you really, if you can back up and look at yourself, now you're closed off just as much as the folk theologian was, but you just can't see it. We had a, uh, that, well, there, there's lots of uh, examples of academic theologians out there in Christianity. One of the best examples is, and I'm not saying everybody on the Jesus Seminar is this way. There are some less liberal people on the Jesus Seminar, and there's many, many conservatives who have actually tried to get on the Jesus Seminar, uh, but uh, I think it's the West Star Institute that runs that. They are they, they're pretty much uh, only accepting of really, really liberal people, or liberal, whenever I say liberal, I mean academic-type theologians who are critical of all, uh, any type of traditions that smell of anything but um, anything but the way that their narrow interpretation, which basically says either you know there is no God, or uh, that people don't rise from the dead, or that um, unless you study in our academic circles, you cannot be one of us type thing. It's just the t same type thing. It's just the same type of hardness of heart. But. Um, the uh, Jesus Seminar, you may have seen it before, but a while back, I mean, gosh, this was all the way back in the 1990s, and I think it, that's whenever I got the book, but they, they published a version of the Gospels, which basically said, we are going to tell you what Jesus actually said in our version of the Gospels. And during this, they had, you know, there, there are many men around a table. I don't know really now how it was constructed, but there are many men who were voting on what Jesus said. So somebody would say, here's what Jesus said next, supposedly, in Mark. How many people think he actually said that? And they voted. <laughs> this is how they made their Bible, is they all voted. And they had a, I, let, let me see if I can get this right. A black bead said he definitely did not say that. A gray bead said he probably didn't say that. A pink bead said he probably did say that. And then a red bead that said he probably did, or he did say that. He definitely did say that. Now, uh, if you can only imagine, there wasn't very much need for red beads in that during that day on that seminar. They didn't have to produce for too many, but they all had them. They all had their piles. I don't know how they were put together, maybe in separate bowls of all these beads, and they would drop them down into a deal, maybe a roll. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I should know because I should have asked them a little bit more because yeah, it was really great whenever I started the Credo House, the last Credo House. Remember, I'm starting a new Credo House, and it's going to be it's gonna be awesome. So hang with me on that. But uh, on the Credo House, whenever I had it before, I, ha I created a, a, a section. This was the Theological Coffee House, right? The Credo House. Um, a section, and it was called Heretic's Corner. And I put all the pictures of the great heretics, Arius and Pelagius, and uh, all, all, I think there were six of them in the corner of Heretic's Corner. And I made Heretic's Corner the most comfortable, so everybody would have to sit there. You just you just wanted to sit there. It was too much fun. People would go there and sit there and take pictures of themselves sitting there. But I, I called the West Star Institute, and I said, I called multiple times. I said, listen, I want some of those beads you guys used back in 1995. 
uh, for uh, voting. And they're like, why do you want the beads? I don't even know if we have them or anything. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I just, I just want them. You know, don't, don't worry about why I want them. <laughs> I just want them. Uh, I wanted to put them in the middle of that table so I could tell the story of what I just told them, put it on top of the Bible that they produced. And I tried and tried and tried to get them to give me beads, and they wouldn't. I'd call with disguised voices, everything else. <laughs> no, I don't really remember. I just remember multiple times I tried. And then Carrie who was my admin at the time, she called one time and got him somehow. She said, yep, I got him. And I was like, how did you get him? She said, well, I just told them we were going to, we were really excited about uh, those beads and what they represented. And we were going to put them in our museum, our theological museum called the Credo House. And they were happy to do it. And so they sent us like three of each. And I couldn't find those beads. I've got them somewhere in this office, but this office is so jam-packed with everything that used to be in the Credo House. But um, <laughs> And I put them in a little box, and there were just red and pink and black and gray beads. And it was really fun to tell the story of academic theologians and how they, how they construct their theology. And so it is something that... Um, uh, is part of our history as Christians, academic theologians. We have, and then we say, what are some examples of academic theologians? And what do you, th why do you think it's, why do you think someone would want to be an academic theologian? There was a, 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 a professor that I had at Dallas Theological Seminary. I didn't have him, excuse me, because he left in the 80s. And I got there in the 90s, late 90s. But uh, a professor, and you may have heard of him, of course you probably have heard of him, Charles Ryrie. He was a professor of systematic theology. And he, I mean, he was a legend whenever I got there, right? Of course. And um, one of the sayings that he had that was so incredibly interesting and I have pondered ever since I heard it, and it still holds true for some unknown reason, and maybe if you can unpack this for me, you you would have an understanding of the universe. You would be able to go on and say, you know, what is the primary question of the universe? What was that on, um, I can't even remember the name of the movie. Oh, well, he said this, listen, listen. Okay. He said, every evangelical, their dream is to be called a scholar by a liberal. Every evangelical's dream is to be called a scholar by a liberal. And I thought, you know, that is very true. It seems like so many times, once you get to a place of, okay, here's your belief, and you're doing it well, but you don't really believe you're doing it well until one of these liberals tell you you're doing it well. And so whenever you can, whenever you can write on the back of your book that even the liberal Bart Ehrman, uh, the skeptic Bart Ehrman, or anybody else that's a hardcore, closed-minded, uh, left side of the theological spectrum, you know, Richard Dawkins or whoever else, if they can say they appreciate your work, then all of a sudden you have gotten a golden star. But why do people think that way? Why is it, why is it that that is the ultimate compliment? Why is it that in our circles, that is sometimes the way we get corrupted to where we want to be called a scholar by a liberal, and that would be the greatest thing? Because we want our enemies to attest to our, to our abilities and to how smart we are, and we need to get over that. That is something that I think is so tragic for us that that, that is true, that that even that that even could be a saying that makes it all the way until today every evangelical's dream is to be called a scholar by a liberal okay so now we move on to the folk the the different um across the board here we go from tabloid to folk theology and you've got naive and you got skeptical you've got sensational and you've got critical You've got gates wide open and gates permanently locked. And what I mean by that on the gates is there are ga gates in your mind. And there are gates that th you, you, let, you either let anything in, like the tabloid theologian, and then close it all immediately and become a folk theologian, or you have the gates permanently locked and you are a academic theologian. And having the gates permanently locked simply means we don't let anything in. We don't have any more reason for locking our gates 
than they do keeping their gates wide open, or really it's about the same amount of reason. It's still closed-mindedness on both sides. It's still closed-mindedness on being able to, on one side, you're, not, you're, not, you're too closed-minded to actually bite something down. And then on the other side, you're too closed-minded to actually open up to other possibilities. And where do we want to be? We want to be somewhere in the, this range. I mean, I think I think it is it is uh, advisable. It is smart. It is not only both of those things, but it is very godly. This is the way that God wants us to be. Somewhere in here, where we are, we where we we are exploring in these areas. Now, wait a minute. Why does acceptable range include folk? <laughs> <laughs> whenever I remade this, that is not supposed to be. That is not supposed to be, okay? Folk theology, is it's supposed to be lay, ministerial, and professional. If you're not watching this, if you're just listening to this, don't worry about what's going on. Okay, so now how do we do theology every day? Well, let's see here. We do theology every day in many different ways. Uh, in uh, Every single, here, here. Let's just go. Let's just run through them real quick. Uh, when we think about God, when we share the gospel, when we interpret the Bible, when we get sick, mentally or physically sick, we do theology. Our theology will come into play. We ask theological questions. When we defend the faith, when we plan for the future, we our theology is going to come into play. How do we plan for the future? Do we just let it happen, or do we? push hard and act responsibly, that our theology determines this. When we choose schooling for our children, our theology is going to help us determine this. When we vote, when we attempt to deal with sin in our lives, when we decide who, on whom to marry, this the, we do theology every day in every way because theology, you can't escape doing theology. Theology is part of everything we do. Okay, what is theology? Theology is credo ut intelligam. Now, this is the word credo, and this is where I get the word credo, credo house, credo house ministries, and then the credo house coffee shop. I just like the the creed. I like the long E on it better, and I also like the band creed, so it works out. So, it should be credo ut intelligam, credo house but I don't pronounce it that. But what does credo mean? Credo means I believe. Credo means I believe, and this is one of the earliest definitions of, philo- of theology put forth by Anselm of Canterbury, which was a redefinition of, uh, or a a similar definition to uh, St. Augustine's. Credo ut intelligum. I believe unto understanding. I believe in order to understand. And then here is St. Augustine's. Uh, it is faith seeking understanding. And, uh, wait, I think I have those backwards. I think I have those backwards. It doesn't matter. The, uh, Anselm said one and Augustine said another. But faith seeking understanding, that is theology. And I like that simply because that is what we are doing. We are believers who are seeking understanding. You cannot get enough understanding to where finally you can take that plunge of faith. I deal with people that are trying to get to that. They're tire kicking their entire life. They're tire kicking and tire kicking. And they're just like one more thing, one more proof, one more understanding, one more rationale, one more piece of the puzzle that I can put together in my theology. And then I'll finally believe or then I'll finally commit. Well, let me tell you something. We we believe very early on in life and that's just the fact of it. That is what we do. I'm not saying that we should be unskeptical, that we should be uncritical. Obviously, that's what I've been saying this whole time. But at the same time, if we're honest with ourselves, we are believers seeking to understand what it is we believe. And really, oftentimes, we don't know why it is we believe. We don't know how it is. Belief is a very mysterious thing. 
Belie scientists study belief. They study the brain and try to understand why it is people believe and which side of the brain and what kind of chemicals are involved in belief, as if you can just insert belief. But belief is a very spiritual thing that comes between you and God, and it will always come between you and God. And so when we look at this, I'm not saying that we are moving to the pure rational side and being eternal tire kickers because what I'm looking at here is I'm saying we are believers who are seeking to understand our belief. That's what most of you all are. That's what most of you said. You already believe. Now let's try to figure out what it is that we believe over the coming, uh, the entire coming year. We're going to, we're going to devote our time to that. So, okay, folks, uh, that is the end of what is theology. That is the end of the section. Can you believe it? We made it through it. Remember, if you can, if you think of it, if you want to, uh, if you believe in what I'm doing, if you believe in the direction we're going with this, please think about going to Patreon forward slash C Michael Patton and joining joining becoming a supporter you'll get all kinds of theological stuff you'll get this entire class that i do formally including the workbooks the pdfs of the workbooks the powerpoints of the workbooks you can't get the physical copy of the workbooks unless you buy it but if you become a patreon at a, at, at any level you'll get a certain percentage off of those workbooks so you can start it in your church do all kinds of stuff but please do that go to patreon and support you can if you want a tax deductible deno donation go to credo ministries.org and you'll see basically the br big broad umbrella of everything that i do everything that we do and um i would love to hear from you i'd love to see you on patreon and uh i hope you join us tomorrow as we pick this back up see you later Bye-bye.